Good evening all. Welcome to this prestigious lecture series conducted by the Bombay City Civil and Civil Court Bar Association. Our president is also coming. Yes, he is there. Welcome all again. I will now commence the program officially. On dais is Madam Roshan Galvi, our President Shubhaskar Sorodi sir, Vice President Vishal Ingole sir. The, this lecture series is arranged in the fond memory of our beloved D.S. Parik sir. His son is here. Mr. Ketan Parikh, who is also a senior advocate. There are Shila Barsarana also there. There are other few young the I will request our president to welcome our speaker, Madam, Roshan Madam. Please, please. 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 Members of the Association who gathered here for the lecture. I welcome all of them. Please welcome my felicity, Madam. I will just say a few words about Madam. Madam and this court has got a long relationship. She was here as a principal judge. And then thereafter she was transferred to Bombay High Court and retired as a Bombay High Court judge in November 2015. She has studied the case management in the University of UK. She also granted a fellowship in peace and conflict resolution for advanced mediation and as such is a Rotary Peace Fellow. She combines mediation with neutral evaluation of resolution or dispute in arbitration. She is a Vice President in Asia of the Commonwealth Judicial Education Institute, LFX Canada. She is a guest lecturer in Tata Institute of Social Sciences in the Masters and Programs on Access to Justice. She conducts workshops for judges, lawyers, law interns, law aspirants, also law teachers on gender sanitization, arbitration, mediation, human rights, case management, commercial contracts, etc. in the national and state judicial academies. Why am I narrating all these things? Because when we started thinking about this series, uh, Mrs. Uh, Srila Balsar Madam contacted me and suggested names of few judges who are ready and willing to give the lecture, deliver the lecture over here. And one of the first names she suggested is of that madam. Because I think that. <laughs> and really, when we have gone through the bio, I really appreciate. And Madam was so punctual, immediately she contacted me, confirmed the meeting and in fact I, will, I would say like a few words about that because today also she was so punctual, she came five minutes before that. So I am grateful for that, her patience also she waited for us. Thank you very much Madam. Now I will request our principal, President Sir, to give the bouquet to Ketan Parikh, who is the son of uh, D.S. Parikh Sir, as a token of appreciation. From our association. Now, now I request President to give the bouquet. Thank you. Now I will request our dignitary speaker, Roshan Galvin Madam, to come and take a stand over here. System of the rule of law. We have very good judgments which are on par with any in the world. They can be read and they are read even elsewhere just as we read judgments from other jurisdictions. But where we fail 
is in our procedures and in our management. And because we fail there, the good work that we do on the substantive side gets all watered down. So it's extremely important that we as lawyers and judges, both of us, must be able to sharpen those talents and those skills. It's extremely important because this has been learned in other jurisdictions which are today working very well. When I was in England and I studied case management, I learned that in the civil justice system for the civil suits and appeals, it used to take earlier less than three years to be disposed of. And then it took more than three years. So everyone was agitated that the system is going to dogs, what is happening, etc. And that was in the early 1990s. Then Lord Justice Taylor said that we must have some other way of working. So that was ADR. And then somebody else said that we must have digitization. So they brought in live notes and all that. But yet, the judges and lawyers used to work as they were working before. So then, friends, there was what is called the Lord Wolf Report. And Lord Justice Wolf refurbished the entire system. I don't want to go into that, which I studied there. And several of those things we have adopted, which as we go along, I will be telling you which they are. But the simple thing about this case management is how we can manage our work better so that we have an edge, so that people feel that, oh, there is some awe to that lawyer or to that judge. And we are not all the time fumbling and all the time working and doing the same thing and not getting any results. Okay? So that is the purpose of case management. And before we go into case management, therefore, what we have to understand is, what is management? Because management has come up very well in the corporate world. And therefore, those people who are in management have a very good image. We lawyers and judges don't have that. Our clients ask us, Even for judges, they say, Oh, you've given a judgment, but after how many years? You see? So that is only because of the lack of procedural aspects. And in our CPC itself, there are many salutary provisions which we tend to forget. But I am not going to be only on those CPC provisions, but on other aspects, each step by step. If we can sort of refurbish and if we can polish those, then it would be much better. Now for this to begin with, I would say that management is in every walk of life. Today, if you are sitting here, young lawyers as well as senior lawyers, without a care in the world, you've got the time, it is because your home is managed well by either your wife or your mother, depending upon your age. Okay? There is kitchen management also. And when you see law, law goes very well with logic, with psychiatry and psychology, with sciences, accounting, in various ways. But it doesn't go somehow gel with management. And now this is beginning to be done. The NIMS Institute in Bombay has got a course on MBA law. You know? So youngsters, when they are coming out, they learn law with management. Unfortunately, most of those youngsters don't become lawyers here in our courts. They go into the corporate world. They know the law and they know how to manage. But if they were to come here, they would be able to manage our courts well. And while they are not doing that, you can manage our courts well. Okay? So that's the thing. So as we go along, what I would say is, in case, man in case management, like in every management, there are these five aspects. Planning, organizing, directing, coordinating, controlling. Okay? Now, whether you want to write one little letter to say your principal judge or to another person, uh, your opponent's lawyer or something like that, or whether you want to manage the country of the size of India, 
these five steps are the only steps required. You can't have four and you can't have six. Okay? Now let us take a letter for example. You are going to write a notice to the other side. You have to plan first with your client. What is it that the client wants? What is it that you are going to demand? Then you have to organize your thoughts. Because if you are going to write in a jumbled up manner, nothing is going to come out of it. So you organize paragraphs, etc. Then you direct your steno or whoever to take down your dictation. Or now to, today you are very computer savvy, so you can type it out yourself and you direct yourself to do that. Then you have to coordinate with your staff. Has the notice gone? What has happened about the notice? And then you have to control with the other side. What, has, what is going to be the outcome of the notice? So this is a lawyer's work. Just a simple thing. Okay? And it involves all these five steps. So all the management books that you will read will have this as a preliminary requirement. Peter Drucker said that any aspect of management consists of planning, organizing, directing, coordinating and controlling. Okay? Now, as I go along, you can visualize your work as lawyers and think how you are going to really have all these five things put in place. Now, when we go along, we find out what is case management. This is management. But what is case management? Case management, Lord Wolf said, is practitioners and judges becoming better at what they do and doing the same thing with less resources and in less time. So you do the same thing. You have to give the notice, you have to argue your case, you have to look up the law, you have to talk to the other side, you may negotiate with them, you have to ultimately get a judgment. But how you do it becomes different and that is with less resources and in lesser time. Every client, if you ask, you ask 10 clients of yours, okay? Whether you want to come to the court for 10 years and I will give you 10 years and I will charge my fees for 10 years or you want to come for only 4 months but I will charge that fee and you have your key and 9 out of 10 will say, I'll give you your fee which you are naming. You give me the verdict in 4 months, usually. Only one of the ten people will say, no, I really want to waste the time of the court. I want to waste my life. I want to delay. I want to get even with that person. They, don't, they want tangible justice. Okay? So with less resources and in less time, in less cost, you can earn your fees quicker. You can go to the next matter quickly. Okay? So this is what... Not just as Wolf said. And that is what they say, how to do more with less. So less amount of time. Our time is very precious. At least we judges don't want any profit. You also certainly want your fees. But you are not wanting corporate profit. Okay? You definitely can get your fees. So you re require more with less. More of the output with less of resources and time. Now, therefore, they say, what does case management involve? Case management actually is improving efficiency, reducing delays and cutting costs. So, you improve efficiency in your court, you are well prepared, you have done your work, etc. And you come and you finish up the matter. You reduce the delays by being so either punctual or whatever you say, very well there. And of course, you cut costs for your clients. So you get the fees inside. Everywhere, people are wanting to pay more if they are otherwise going to pay less, ultimately. So now the ambit. The ambit of case management is procedural and substantive laws. That is what we have in our system. Procedural laws and substantive laws. And both of these would require, one, infrastructure and two, sensitivity. Now, infrastructure is what the government can give us, what the high court can give us. Now, we are having better and better infrastructure. We are having digitized courts, etc., etc. I don't want to go into that infrastructure. But assuming you don't have that infrastructure also, if you have got that sensitivity that my client has been at the receiving end, I must get him or her that kind of uh, relief, you can say. We call it relief or a verdict in lesser time. 
then that is your sensitivity. Okay? So everything requires that. Now we are civil and criminal judges. Case management is essentially for civil lawyers. Of course, it, it can be replicated for criminal work also. But in civil law, you require several stages to keep in mind. The first thing is, is the plaint or the petition. I have just given the points. Okay. Now, as judges, when we read the plaint, when we read the petition, what do we find? This is the inside story that I am telling you about what I found for 27 years when I was a judge. So, oh my God, what is written here? I can't understand also. So, we see the first few paragraphs and then we scroll through and we see the submissions last. We see whether court fee is paid and what are the prayers. Then we see the documents. So, we say, oh, this is the document, this is the relief that they want and we understand more or less what this is. Now we have to hear the lawyers. Now when Justice M.B. Shah was the Chief Justice and he came and he was appalled by the Bombay plaints and petitions. It was not so in Gujarat like that. So he said, what is this, all this? I, we can't read all of these things overnight. So he said, you must give the synopsis. And in all the High Court petitions and plaints, there were synopsis. We started, I suppose, that even in the City Civil Court. But we found that the synopsis also run into 25 pages. So we said, where are we going to look at the main points in the synopsis which we are wanting to know while we are just reading beforehand? So we said, okay, give a chronology of events and dates, which is really the synopsis. Now this is all that lawyers and judges actually want. A good lawyer will always make a good chronology. Even if it is not done, and if you are for the defendant, let us say, you know, you must, as a lawyer, read the plain, make your notes chronologically. That is a very sound practice, this. So we got chronology. So this is how a plain should be. The CPC says it should be brief, precise and concise. And we have planes which are long, verbose and not precise. Okay? Now, how many man hours go into this kind of a plane? which nobody wants to read. You can only tell, show your client that your plaint is of 255 pages. But ultimately, what you get out of that plaint is what he is interested in. Okay? So, this is the first thing which is in your domain. Okay. The second is service. Service of the plaint. Now, right from the time of 1999 amendments to the CPC, the um, CPC was amended with the purpose that you can serve any way you want. Okay? So at that time they said that it's not only bailiff service but also by registered post, also by emails, then thereafter also by couriers and now there is a Supreme Court judgment also on WhatsApp. Correct? What is the purpose and intent? We lawyers always see the purpose and intent of every statute. So we must see the purpose and intent of every section of the statute. Right? Now the purpose and intent is that the defendant must have knowledge of the fact that this kind of a plaint is filed. Right? Now in the civil suits, even in appeals and everywhere, you know, in the civil jurisdiction, whatever is filed, everything is by way of urgency that you come to court. Correct? So there is an interim proceeding. Right? We call it notice of motion or we call it exhibit 5 in the districts or we call it only interim applications in other jurisdictions. But I am talking about that interim application. Now when an interim application is taken out in whatever proceeding, what does the lawyer do? That lawyer, the plaintiff's lawyer or the appellant's lawyer will serve a copy upon the other side and give notice that on such and such a day I am going to move for interim relief. You may remain present if you so desire. Finished. Service is complete. Provided, of course, you send, you send everything with the N extras and everything, of course. Now, in that case, therefore, service actually is not required thereafter. Now, please understand and please visualize. In so many of the suits, in your court, in the high court, everywhere, copies are given. The defendant knows everything. The interim applications go on and thereafter, there is a direction to serve the writ of summons. Nobody in the world does this except judges and lawyers. Nobody. 
If you go to a if you go to a club, for example, and you pay your club fees, they will not again send you notice that you have to pay the fees. They just make a note that the club fees are paid, finished for that year, if it is year to year, for example. You know? But we do this unnecessary work. And therefore, suits come up on board so many times. Judges have no time to take up the entire board. Lawyers can have no time to appear for all of this rubbish. Therefore, they don't appear. Nobody knows anything. Matters are taken up and adjourned, taken up and adjourned. And the client wonders what is happening. So that is so far as service is concerned. Now we have these two other things, the ad interim relief and the interim application, which you all are familiar with in any civil jurisdiction. Now at the time of this interim application, if you are going to have an ad interim relief also and then an interim application, one must be preliminary. The other must be proper, correct? That is the purpose of having two such reliefs. Now, if you are going to have ad interim relief, which goes on for 15 hearings, then you must not have the interim relief. Then that, that whatever is the order on that ad interim relief must form a part of the interim relief. But in our system, in so many courts, and I know about this court while I was here also, I never did that, but I was told to do that quite often. You hear the ad interim relief, you have adjourned or you've got everything on board and then you have to hear the notice of motion. For what purpose? People are just wondering why again, again I have to come and again you are going to say the same thing. That is how clients view us, lawyers as well as judges. So these are two of the stages before the trial stage which is the third stage. Even in an appeal, there are sometimes two of these stages before admission and then the final hearing revisions also and all of these things. But now, let us understand, we have these stages. At whatever one stage, you have to have everything threadbare because that is on merits. And merits we cannot hustle with. We have to not haste upon it, we have to really argue well, we have to hear well, we have to decide well. So both of us, the lawyers and judges, would be doing that thing threadbare. Now at that time, when the interim application is heard, that should be the interim application actually, everyone knows the matter threadbare. The lawyers also understand everything. The client behind him also knows that all this my lawyer has said. The judges also now know everything. Whatever they have read and whatever they have heard and then of course they will read cover to cover to find out and to satisfy themselves. It is at this stage that we don't do certain things which we must do. There is no law against it. There is no bar. These are the practices which have come, which are wrong. Those practices can be corrected by lawyers and judges coming together, working as a team and sort of doing that, okay, we will have it this way. I'll tell you how. At that interim stage, what I've said is one defense. Because in our system, there are sometimes two defenses. You have an affidavit in reply. Then in the suit, you have a written statement. Everything is verbatim the same. It is one in first person and one in third person. We can do away with this. Unless only you want to show your client that this is something great, which after some time the client will feel is not something great. But you can do it once and charge your client for doing it twice. If it is going to be finished and if ultimately he is going to get the relief, which of course you are supposed to give him, then everything is fine. So you can have one defense. Now how do we have one defense? Affidavit in reply is a statement on oath made by the client himself. There is nothing more that can be done. Pleading is only what the pleader gives. That is what the advocate gives in third person. And therefore it has to be verified by the client. And now we have got a system of having an affidavit in support of that pleading so that then thereafter the lawyer will say the client said this. Correct? Absolutely right. Now if you are going to have that and if there is going to be an affidavit in reply, where is the need for another written statement? It is the written statement. In the district courts, this system is much better. In district court judges, what they do is, as soon as the plaint is filed, they tell the defendant, Give me your written statement. In Bombay, they will say, we cannot file the written statement for 60 days. Because 59 days, we are not going to think about it. 
Then 60 on day we will start thinking and then we'll say, please extend the time. Now, does that look nice? In the districts, they don't do that. We had one judge from Goa. And that judge was a very kind judge and sort of, you know, not very much hassled with things. He used to tell us that when we had the Portuguese procedure code, the defendant had to file his written statement within nine days. And we got the written statement. And then we were using the CPC. And the defendant can file within 30 days, within 60 days, within 90 days, or sometimes after 180 days also if the judge wants. So no defendant files anything. It's like that. You, know? you have a particular law and you abide the law. That gives you the image. Okay? So if you have just one defense, you go through this whole rigmarole once and not twice, or even thrice sometimes. Then the next thing for every lawyer and judge, a very sound thing, and which I learned from Justice Kanya when we were judges, is admissions. Even if the defendant or the respondent in an appeal or a revision or whatever will deny, 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 deny everything, you will be able to find out as lawyers that there are some admissions. We will be able to find out as judges also that there are some admissions with all of those denials. Okay? Now let us take an example of, let us say an administration suit, partition suit, whatever, you know. Invariably, the relationship is admitted. Nobody says he is not my brother. But he says he has not done this, he has not done that, I deny that he has got this, I deny he has got the right. But the brotherhood is admitted. Okay? Then if there is an administration suit and if there is an estate of the deceased, the estate is essentially admitted. Unless the estate is very large and one brother or one sister says, no, no, I was gifted this. So it doesn't form a part of the estate of my father or something like that. You know? Now what happens is, these main two things are the only things actually required. When the relationship is admitted, when the property is admitted, what do you have to do? You have to see the prayers. Correct? Now what do we all do? We take out a notice of motion. We say don't deal with, dispose of, etc, etc. Fair enough. Okay? That much we get. Then you say no, appoint the receiver. Where is the need? The property is between two brothers. Receiver doesn't have, doesn't have to be appointed for most of the matters and it is receiver is not appointed. But you make that application and then you say that is not given, this prayer is given. And then all the long, the person who is in the wrong, who doesn't want to give that brother anything, continues in possession. Now, okay, that man and his lawyer will want this stalemate to be there. But the plaintiff's lawyer at least should not want it. So the plaintiff's lawyer must say, that we have to do something better. Now, what is that better thing? We'll come to a little later. But essentially what I say is, for all of these matters, as lawyers also, when you are reading the plaint, when you are going to argue, find out the admissions. As judges, I tell them, record the admissions. There is no need for any evidence. There is no need to call the people. Just record. These are admitted facts. The estate is admitted. The relationship is admitted. Enough. Okay? This will help to narrow down the dispute, the, the issues. Because the issues are only of material disputed facts. Now, I personally feel that if a lawyer drafts 36 issues, it means that he doesn't know anything and there is a lot of confusion in his mind. Issues can never be that many. Because only what is material, not every statement which is admitted or denied that you have becomes an issue, and only the narrowed down issues which are in dispute. So making of issues is actually like giving subtitles. If you are going to write an essay, you are going to have some kind of subtitles in your mind. Again, that is planning, organizing, directing, coordinating, controlling. So this is organizing. Okay? When you have the issues, you know what evidence you are going to lead. And you will not lead unnecessary evidence. When you have got the admissions done, you will not have unnecessary issues. Okay? So everything becomes clear, concise and to the point. 
you must not miss out anything that your client will want of course but you must not add needless things that is the point i am making okay so now after the issues are framed we go to the stage of evidence inspection etc of course is between the lawyers it is not a part of the court because you have to do it in the lawyer's office assuming that inspection is completed etc notice is are given for production of documents we come to the stage of evidence now there is a general belief i feel that in a civil suit there must be some oral evidence it's completely wrong there are quite a few civil suits which need not have any oral evidence you can have only documentary evidence but generally that thing is in the head of lawyers as well as judges that something must be recorded you know this is the oral evidence which is recorded i had one very interesting suit when i was a judge here it was between brothers and sisters the father had ancestral lands there were farms you know in the suburbs father died in 1948 then the mother the brother and the sister i mean the son and the daughter were there okay now because there were ancestral lands father and son were the only two co-partners of the ancestral lands which you have property but in 1937 when the father died under the hindu women's right to property act the mother got the share which the father had in the co-partner she could not be a co-partner but she became a member of the huf and had everything that the co-partner had okay so that half property of the father came into the mother's possession now these were an agricultural land so she was tilling the land then comes 1956 the hindu succession act section 14 any widow in possession of any estate became a complete owner so the mother became a complete owner of that half share right and the son was the owner of the other half share now the mother died after this act i think about in 1989 or something like that and the daughter filed the suit against the brother that give me half the estate of the mother that means one fourth of their estate okay so this was told to me and i said you argue i have to see the hindu women's right to property act i have to see the uh, hindu succession act and i'll decide whether you got the right or not she is a married woman she has not tilled the fields all sorts of unnecessary detail i said okay i'll decide so i said that i will not record any oral evidence because everything is admitted ancestral lands father's death mother's death what is the property is actually in the question of law what were the properties and what is the present relationship of the parties nothing more is required question of law has to be decided both parties went in appeal against my direction and order the revision or whatever that they filed and the high court says when both parties want to lead evidence it is wrong for the judge not to lead evidence so lead evidence i said all right begin the evidence so we led the evidence the son let the evidence of about one and a half pages saying that he is entitled he was a co-partner father was a co-partner mother was not a co-partner okay all these are admitted facts it all came in the evidence evidence is a statement of disputed facts so all of these were redundant i took all of them on record because the high court told me i was a civil court judge and the son said that the 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 um, plaintiff said that sister said that i have gone to the uh, what is that the revenue authorities and there is this order this order this order and then ultimately i got the order go to the civil court because only the civil court can decide the title okay these are also admitted facts the brother knew about all of this they are not required by me now i have to decide as a civil court what is the title of both the parties correct so i again let the evidence and then they said this girl she got married and then she was not coming to our house all of those unnecessary details i can't decide title on how good or bad she was so then i gave the judgment ultimately they argued they showed me this law and i wrote in my judgment that this was all that was required the entire evidence is redundant 
Mercifully, it was one and a half pages and two pages, you know. And only the brother and the sister led evidence. They didn't get any other unnecessary witnesses. And I would have liked that matter to go in appeal. But the brother and sister settled. And I knew how much time I wasted over needless things. This brother and sister had to come to my court again and again. And then ultimately get whatever I would have given them after considering only the question of law, because they were all admitted facts. So there are some matters where we don't require oral evidence. Written evidence was there, documentary evidence was there, you know, all of this. All admitted facts. These are the things which are latent, which a good lawyer must pick up. And not only go on and on without thinking. That is case management, ultimately. Okay? And similarly for the judges. It is for the judges to understand and grasp and say, oh, this is the main thing. Then you have case management. Now, suppose you require oral evidence. You have to lead oral evidence. Now, under Order 18, Rule 4, there has got to be cross-examination. Mercifully, now we have an affidavit of examination in chief. Even that affidavit of evidence contains exactly the plaint so many times and the written statement, including the submissions and the case law, all of those things which are not required, which can be just shown to the judge separately. So you are not going to cross-examine anybody on the case law. Okay. But assuming that it is there, I would say the plaint itself can be taken as the evidence. If you are going to say the same thing, if you want to say something extra, by all means say, file your affidavit. There can be. But if it is not so, then it is not required. But we take this, whatever I was there, to not waste time. Then comes the cross-examination. Now, under Order 18, Rule 4, the only thing which the court can outsource is recording of cross-examination. I would love to record the cross-examination. I really like it in a very good matter, like for example, a fraud or something like that, you know. It's very interesting to record. But I always resisted that. Because I said, somebody else can do it. And who are those people? Those are our young lawyers who are going to become great trial lawyers of tomorrow. So we give them that opportunity to record the evidence. Instead of going with the senior, doing nothing, it is so much better that you record something which another senior says. So there is a question and an answer. And in fact, I think there is no need for all questions and answers also. It can be a narrative. There is no bar in law. It is only a wrong practice which has set in. That if there is a commissioner, then there must be question and answer. No law says that. Okay? And I feel if the, lawyer, if the commissioner is a lawyer or a retired judge or a retired officer or something like that, from, he is a man of law, you know, then there is the need for him not to record a narrative. He cannot, of course, rule on the admissibility of documents. That can be separate. And therefore, what we do is, we mark the documents right in the beginning. Okay? So, admitted documents go in. Certified copies of public records go in. Registered documents go in. Only the other documents, which must be proved by the author of the document, will remain. And that author would have to come. It may be the party. It may be somebody else. That, of course, will remain because he has to be cross-examined. Okay? Now, as you, you as lawyers, and as the Bar Association itself, you must find out your talent, your group of lawyers, the young lawyers who will be commissioners. They are the future cross-examiners. And you are going to give that to your country, actually. Okay? And you can work out with your judges that, you know, all the cross-examinations can be given. We have in our high court the court rooms which are used for this purpose. You've got so many courtrooms. You can use them in the evening for recording the evidence. Young lawyers can record. The senior lawyers can go and actually cross-examine or whichever way that you want at different places or at different times. So that is so far as the evidence is concerned and that is streamlining the evidence. And court commissioners, what I have said next is included in that. Then comes a small little thing, a returnable date. When I was the judge here, we used to have 
as soon as the suit is filed and an interim application is taken up, the notice of motion is given a returnable date. All right. Now, sometimes the returnable date is different from the returnable date in the suit. So, what happens is sometimes the notice of motion comes up on board, sometimes the suit comes up on board. You argue the notice of motion, you say the suit is on that date, so you adjourn it. When the suit comes up, you say notice of motion is adjourned on that date, so you adjourn it. And you do all sorts of clerical work. The judge also does that clerical work. A simple thing that you can do is when you are giving the returnable date or you as lawyers, when you are taking a returnable date, take the same date. So, as soon as the suit is filed, correct? You get a returnable date. When you take out the notice of motion, the first date can be that returnable date. Because the ad interim relief is decided. You either get some injunction or it is refused. Correct? Then the notice of motion and the suit come up together. A very small thing. But I would say it goes a very long way in case management. Then everything comes together. The notice of motion and the suit. If you are going to have mediation, if you are going to settle, everything is done together. Nothing is lost. Okay? So that is what I consider quite important. Then rejection of plaint. Now some of the suits can be disposed of on the bar, on jurisdiction, on payment of court fees, etc. You know? So that is a weeding out procedure. That must not be forgotten. But for every single suit, please don't say rejection of plaint because the judges will have to say, no, no, I am not rejecting the plaint. That becomes a remedy worse than the disease. Okay? So, when you find that there is a bar, there is no jurisdiction, then it can be sent to another court or the plate can be rejected altogether. Okay. So, that is weeded out. Then oral applications. I think quite a few judges and lawyers want every single application in writing. Judges say that you put a 3 rupee stamp, court fee stamp or something like that. I don't believe that everything should be in writing and the other party has to say. You can just tell the court that this is a small application and the court can pass a two-line order. That can be done in many matters. And especially those applications like bringing heirs on record. For example, every single civil suit today is such that the cause of action will survive. Okay? We don't have civil suits of painters and dancers that the painter has died or the dancer has died and therefore the cause of action comes to an end. It can't uh, survive to the heirs, the suit are best. We don't have those kind of suits. We have suits on possession, on property, on ownership, on title, all of those. Correct? Now, when I was in England, I learned that when a plaintiff or a defendant dies, the lawyer only comes into the court, gets the record and makes an entry that these are the heirs. And he gives notice to the other side, these are the heirs. Now, you make, you, you change your pleading. You amend it. I am not going to amend it. And in those five minutes, the application is finished. There is nothing like a court order. Because all the cause of action survives only. You know? Now, please understand how many such small, small applications we make. Sometimes to show the client that we have got a very brilliant idea. Or sometimes to show the court that I am very busy. Or whatever that is. But ultimately, what do you get out of it? You only waste that time and the last relief remains pending for your poor client. Okay. Then comes original documents. Now, you have taken uh, inspection of original documents before, of course, this, uh, after the issues are framed, etc. But <coughs> usually, though lawyers say that we are fixing there's three dates. Even in my arbitrations nowadays, the lawyers say, I'm fixing these three dates. And then you say, no, I cannot come on any of these three dates. So I am fixing other three dates and all of those. The judges don't have to bother with that. They are doing other work. You are doing that in your office. Okay. But what I used to always do is, sometimes inspection is not given or taken. Either the lawyer has not asked or something. But it may become very important. I used to always put one line on my board throughout that no relief will be granted except with original documents. So, if original documents are brought in court, one is that sometimes, you know, Xerox copies may be fabricated or something. It doesn't, doesn't happen always, but it does happen sometimes, you know. Then I can immediately see the original document. Sometimes if this other lawyer makes a 
uh, a grievance that I have asked for uh, inspection but the inspection is not given. I can say, okay, take it just now. Inspection is finished. Simple thing. You have to give inspection. I said, okay, he's not giving inspection, forget it. He will not be entitled to rely upon it. So he'll give inspection. So that's how it is. And the compilation. Now that is really for our convenience so that we don't get all original documents. They are kept in kind of safe way. And compilations everyone uses. Very sound thing. You can mark on the compilations. Make all your compilations, small, large, whatever that is, and we can use. Then comes the stage of arguments. Now, for arguments, also there are two types, like the evidence, oral and documentary. Arguments are oral and written. Okay. Now, quite often, for some reason, the lawyers want to have both in details. That's not required. Either you argue orally, in great depth, you know, and make everything known. And then I always say, give me only bullet points so that I don't miss out the points. I made my notes while you were arguing. So that much is gone off. Or you say, no, I, I, may, not, I may think that you may forget. So therefore, I want to give written arguments. Very fine. Give written arguments. Insist on written arguments. Whatever the judge wants, whatever you want. But then curtail your oral arguments. Because when there are written arguments, you can just scan through them and the judge will literally read them. It's on his record now. Right? So that also helps to save time. And then comes the judgment. That is not really for you all. But when I give this kind of a lecture to the judges, then I say judgment, we must give immediately. It is good for everyone. And the best for judges. Because we tend to forget because there are so many matters that come in between. Okay? And we may make mistakes. So it's ideal that a judge, I used to give my first draft in the evening. Just a plain draft. Nothing much. I may make four drafts afterwards. Add, put riders, see the law, do some research, whatever. But that first draft gives me the ambit of what I'm going to do. That is what I thought. But that's really not for you. But you can insist on a judgment. Because under the CPC, a judgment has to be given within the time limit. And that's good for all. Then comes this judgment on arguments, which I actually told you when we dealt with oral and written. You must find out that as lawyers, and that is a very good skill, you must find out which of your cases can be disposed of on arguments. At least if you have a good case. One party has a good case, one party has a bad case. So many lawyers know I've got a bad case, but I've got to cope up. Okay, I'm not taking those lawyers because you, you may have to delay. Your client has given you the brief to delay. But at least those lawyers who have a good case can find out whether it is now judgment on arguments that you can get. It is called summary judgments in America. And they say that 90% of the matters which go to court ultimately end up in summary judgments. Because oral evidence is not required. So which are the matters which, where you can do that? One is like the case which I told you. I have written about that in great depth in my book also. Because I really like that case for case management. And that is on admitted facts. Then sometimes we have interpretation of documents. For example, a partnership suit. We admit that he is a partner. But under the document, what is the actual profit and loss that we are going to share? What are the assets and liabilities? The shares are different. Decide. The, the court will decide. The document is admitted. So execution of documents admitted doesn't have to be proved because admitted facts don't have to be proved. They have to be simpliciter marked. And then there is no need for any oral evidence. You have to have interpretation. Now if you are a lawyer who requires this kind of an ultimate verdict, you must now go, especially under the Commercial Courts Act, because there is now a special provision under the Commercial Courts Act for summary judgments. Okay, So that is judgments on argument. It can be on admitted facts, on ex admitted execution of documents for interpretation, or on admitted or on questions of law. All of those. Okay. Then comes ultimately the whole thing has happened and costs. We don't give compensatory costs, realistic costs, actual costs. 
actually there should be reasonable cause and at least the lawyer who has got a very good case and who has got a very good judgment must insist upon that because that is the law today and if judges give really realistic cause a lot of frivolous litigation would go okay so that's it then comes the adr i want to tell you a little bit more about this adr essentially the mediation part you have got lok nyayalay as i just read a board that there is some going to be some lok nyayalay which is adr but you lawyers can negotiate with one another and that is client counseling we've got an excellent mediator here she's she's flooded with mediation work now because she doesn't look at the courts why because you develop that kind of a skill now many lawyers can do that today in mnlu there is a masters degree course on mediation for 2 years and i do evaluative mediation in that course as a guest lecturer there are so many people and we don't have only lawyers we have bankers we have government people we have corporates and i would say one word of caution if lawyers are not going to be able to negotiate and not going to be able to do it others will so don't think that for decades you will be able to stall the mediation process and just go on delaying matters in the court clients are also becoming very smart they also know what is the real truth okay now in bangalore in delhi this has settled very well in bombay it is not so much well settled and it's only because lawyers don't want it but you can do the client counseling you can negotiate and tell your client that sitting in my office i can give you this 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 what do you want do you really want to go to court can we have a midway and i tell you at least 6 out of 10 clients will say get me this just now because these are business people they are family people they have to keep family ties business ties whatever adr will work and once adr gets settled you will not feel like doing something else so there are some of you who can then say i am a mediator that's it you can give out your card as a mediator other lawyers can come to you whoever well, my client doesn't want to settle how can you settle this matter i think it is worth settling so all this way and i'll show you by some slides something else and then comes the summary suits we have got the summons for judgment you know that negotiable instruments act guarantees dishonor checks etc it must be summarily disposed of so defendant may say i've got a substantial defense when he doesn't have a substantial defense but at least the plaintiff's lawyer must say that this is a negotiable instrument there is a presumption of consideration please give me the judgment today it can be given not that it can be given you don't have your summons for judgment can be made as now some of the salutary provisions of the cpc that i find are these res judicata is section 11 again and again you don't come to court very simple hmm? interest and costs as i have told you compensatory realistic interest and of course costs and of course interest that is always given rejection of plaint again i told you a very salutary provision weeding out provision admissions under order 10 rule 1 and it all begins with order 10 because when something has to be contested it begins with order 10 that is the admissions always think of what are the admissions and write them down in your way. as a defendant as a plaintiff both ways okay and then judgment on admission for those matters as i told you so you get order 12 rule 6 judgment on admission so you can actually make an application instead of making all other applications this application must come to court give me a judgment on admission this much amount is admitted this much property is admitted whatever that is then preliminary issue that is also very essential so that some suits can be disposed of on a question of jurisdiction or the question of limitation okay if that is so otherwise of course all the issues that can come up then the other thing is the parties that are not at issue today order 15 is gone after the 2015 amendment i don't know why i thought it was a very salutary provision and i have given one or two judgments under order 15 rule 3 there again though it is not preliminary it is not for 
limitation or jurisdiction. It is on any other aspect by which the suit can be disposed of. Very salutary provision. But it is not used by lawyers. Now today we have got um, order 15A, which is the case management order. So that you know you give those dates and you have to, but nobody abides even if dates are given. Judges cannot take it up on those dates. Lawyers don't come on those dates. So case management hearings are completely fruitless. That's how it is. And then the right to begin. Order 18, Rule 1. Another salutary provision. So often, a plaintiff doesn't require to go into the witness box. But the plaintiff goes into the witness box. He is cross-examined needlessly. Ultimately, what is decided is on what the defendant says. So if the defendant has admitted something, but has got something else to say, then the defendant has the right to begin. And that right to begin, the way it is drafted is a right to begin. But it is actually the duty to begin. And the judge must say, no, you begin first. You see, I had one very interesting matter where the lady had made an application for a property against her husband. And the property was large, big parties. And there were two properties made into one. So she said that one is in my name with my husband. One is in my mother-in-law's name with my husband. Okay. So the husband admits that this property is in her name with me. And he says, but I have paid consideration for both. Alright, I said, show me the consideration that you have paid. So he has admitted that her name is there. She is an owner on record. But I have paid consideration. He didn't want to do that. And he showed me all sorts of judgments where judges have said that plaintiff has to begin. I thought it was wrong. And I said, I am not going to take the plaintiff's evidence. I will start with the defendant's evidence. And when I started with the defendant's evidence, that was the end. He had to show me the consideration. That's all. So these are what I would call case management, case mismanagement activities. Without thinking, you do what others have done. Because everybody, is, you know, mostly all the matters, plaintiff has to lead evidence. So you feel that in all the matters, plaintiff has to lead evidence. Wrong. Okay. Then comes the preliminary decree. Now I gave you the example of an, admin, of an administration suit or a partition suit. If, similarly, there are other suits like partnership, mean profits, etc. But there can be a preliminary decree. And quite often, preliminary decree is on admitted facts. Like I told you, four brothers... Nobody will say he is not my brother. So the relationship is admitted. Correct? If there is an estate or if there is just one property which has to be partitioned, the property is admitted. The preliminary decree then would have to be passed on day one. It is not passed for years. That is case mismanagement. But who is responsible? The plaintiff's lawyer at least must tell the court, pass a preliminary decree. In some of the suits, it can be passed. Now, once the preliminary decree is passed, the other thing is what? Under the CPC, the final decree. But I would say that is not the sound procedure. Because then to pass the final decree on whatever is the, 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 the divisions that we have got to make may not be the right approach. What do you think is the right approach? Once the preliminary decree is passed, the right approach is ADR. Now, which is my share? We are all in a partition suit. We are all heirs of somebody. We are partners. What is my share? So you come together by way of mediation. And you determine your share based on the law and some give and take. That is an ideal procedure. All of these matters are very, very attuned to mediation. So now the mediation strategy. It is called the strategy of POS. One is... Identify the problems, P. Then you find out the options, O. And then you get the solution, S. Simple. But you will find that it is not so simple unless you go to a mediator like the lady here. Then she makes it very simple. But what you have to do is at least one party can feel that I want the relief for my client quickly. So let us see what can be the solution. Okay? And then it helps and a new culture of working will set in. Now for that, what do we do? There is what is called connecting people and client counseling. So there is lawyer, lawyer, client, client. Okay? 
this one's lawyer, that one's lawyer, this client, that client. And now all of them have to come together. And then each lawyer has to do client counseling to tell your client, see, this is not a good case. Therefore, if we can get it by this means, it would be better. Or the other lawyer would say, we've got a very good case. But how many years are we going to spend? And I'm going to charge you for the years that I'm going to put in. So why not finish it? And all the lawyers as well as the clients will really, if you do it in the right spirit, benefit. And then what is the right time for mediation? Right time for negotiation, for settling. And all of these are right times, I would say. One is, as soon as you know that a notice has come, that a suit has been filed, it is very good at that stage to tell the other side, if you want to settle, let us see, let us meet. Because the other things have not come in and there is not bitterness. Then there is an early stage mediation in other countries, they say ESM. So early stage mediation also, if you go to another mediator, if you go between the two of you, the two lawyers, and try to mediate, mostly the clients would agree. It is the lawyers who don't agree. And I tell you, please believe me, if you are going to do this, your stature will improve. Your clients will come back to you. You will have time to do other matters. Because there are so many thousands of matters waiting. And all of you can take up those matters. So you are not going to be earning less. That thing which is in our heads in Bombay is a wrong notion. In Delhi, in Bangalore, it has settled very well. In Bangalore, there is the BCIC, that is the Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce. We have BCCI here, Bombay Chamber of Industry and Commerce. That Bangalore Chamber has sort of partnered with the media, High Court Mediation Center in Bangalore. And all of those business people are finding it very fruitful. Because they say, okay, we can have give and take, we can negotiate, we can settle our disputes and we can do our business. So the, client, the lawyers are actually doing very good service to their clients by telling them, you may take a little less but get it quickly. Or, you know, you forget it, give a little more but you are away from it quickly so that you can go back to your business. So all of this, for commercial matters especially, is very, very important. Then after the witness statements are exchanged, that is our affidavit in reply as we say, uh, sorry, our affidavit of evidence. You know what is the case of the other side, you know what are the documents. You can tell your clients, let us see this document may come on record, instead of that let's settle today. That is also a good time. After the cross-examination is recorded, of course everybody knows whose case is good, whose case is bad. All lawyers know, not only judges. So that is a good time. And at the time of judgment and award, if suppose you have failed in all of those, even at that time, it's not a bad time. In America, when it started, it started more with the first appeals. Because one judgment came and then parties thought that if one judgment is a good judgment, reasoned judgment, in all probability, this is the ultimate thing. Not, appeals will, not that appeals will be set aside, etc. And they were doing it. So that is how it began. Then, you know, all these mediation, all these settlement strategies, as you say. In most of our matters, it deals with movable or immovable property, right, in the civil jurisdiction. So, buy or sell. You put one figure. These are the ways which are now settled in the world of different modes of mediation and different modes of settling. So, a figure for a property is fixed. One man says, I will buy at this, or another man says, I will sell at this one figure. The second is, one party puts the value, the other party says, I will buy or I will sell. That also has worked in many cases. Because then you can't put a wrong value. The property is worth 10 crores. You can't say it is worth 1 crore. It's all right, I'll buy it. Okay? So, a basically good value comes. Then if you have to choose from many properties, say in estate matters, things are there. There are fewer cases of that side. But then, how do you choose? So there are different kinds of property with different values you can put. The biggest property, second biggest, third biggest. And then you can choose. These are the ways in which they say, you take one and four. I'll take two and three. You can settle, you know, if there are many properties. So there are these ways. Then to, again, as I told you, sorry, that is this, choose between properties. And 
Then when you have in mediation, when you are coming together, you have these four arms. There is a judge, there are the lawyers, there is a mediator and there are the parties. And all of them have to work in that system with that idea that they will put an end to it so that everyone goes home reasonably happy, I would say. Reasonably happy, at least they would be. And now in so many of these statutes, we have got this concept of mediation. So it, it must be taken up. Now the Commercial Courts Act, there is a specific mediation provided. That is the first thing. It has not worked well because lawyers don't want it. But if some lawyer feels that let me try, as in, I'm telling you it is going to succeed. Ultimately, the client will say, well, I got a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. And they've got common sense, even if we have got legal sense. Right? So it will pick on and some people can be the leaders. Then under the Companies Act, we have got under Section 442, there are ways in which the NCLT now says settle between companies so that, you know, directors, the agents, how the management has to go, all that can be decided. Under the Consumer Protection Act, there, is, there are specific provisions. The MACT has got for quite some time these provisions and now it has come in RERA. So in RERA also, and that is working very well, and uh, you can say that you get something called tangible justice. If today the, you can give the client a little bit, it is much better than giving the client a little more after 10 years. So, these are some of the business principles which can be incorporated into a lawyer's study. Now they do LLB, uh, 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 sorry, MBA LLB. They are those in the NIMS and all that. So, they teach the children to become not only good lawyers but good business people. So, when they are business people, they know what is the law and what the lawyers are doing. And when they become lawyers, they understand what businesses are. And some of those principles are extremely important for us, for lawyers. See, one is the non-value added items. This is a very good business principle. A businessman will not do anything which does not give him value. You see these water bottles? Formerly, these water bottles used to come with that cellophane paper on top, if you remember. Now we don't have that. Why? Because the businessman thought that this is a non-value added item. In any case, this is sealed. So why should I put a cellophane paper? Why should I make the cost for a cellophane paper? So he increased his profit, reduced his costs. Lawyers don't work that way. But if lawyers also can say that I will give my client today something which is tangible rather than go on waiting for 10 years and hoping that he will get something much more. You will be doing a lot of service to your clients. These are non-value added items. Okay. So you know this big rocks which is there is a very nice story which is always taught in business schools. A businessman, a, a, a professor goes in a class with a big picture, big stones, small stones and rocks, pebbles, sand and water. And the children are just, the students are just looking. The professor goes and puts in the big rocks, then he puts in the small stones, sand, everything. And he's is asking the students, is the picture full? So the students look and say, yes sir, the picture is full. And then he takes the sand, he pours the sand inside, shakes the, uh, the pot, sand goes down, then he puts the water, water goes down until it comes to the brim. And then the professor asks his students, is the pitcher full? The students say, yes sir, of course it is full now. The professor says, how? What is the moral of this story? So the students are business students, no? They, they know how to make pompous statements. So they say that, sir, no matter what you have, time and space, there is still some more. The professor says, this is a very sound principle, but this is not the moral of this story. The moral of this story is that if you don't put in your big rocks in the picture first, you will never be able to put them in at all in the picture. Now you please imagine, if you put the sand, if you put the small stones and rocks, the big rocks will always stay out. Okay? 
Now consider our profession, the profession of judges and lawyers. We put in all unnecessary things, small, small applications, thinking that we are making our clients very proud and we are making a great example. And the judges go on for passing all those orders, thinking that he is giving some great judgment. But the main things remain. And they can't be taken up. They are the big rocks. So the real thing for both lawyers and judges is, put in your big rocks in the picture first. Then the small rocks will take care of themselves. Now how do you do that? To judges I tell them, when there is a path heard matter, Put that matter first on board. Take up that matter. In the meantime, the other matters which are not ready will become ready because you just discharge your word. You have not done work in that. The lawyers are happy because they have got some more time and they get ready. When that matter gets ready, take it up and do it. Now some judges go through the entire board and adjourn. Non-value added item. You don't get any value. Nobody gets. The lawyers don't get, the clients don't get, the judge doesn't get. Okay? But if you take up the first matter and your first path heard matter is the main matter, when you finish it, you know that the lawyers have done a good job, the judges have done a good job, the clients are happy. So that's how it would be. Then of course, core competence. That you all know very well. So there are some lawyers who are civil lawyers, some lawyers who are criminal lawyers, then you have got that core competence. I would say even judges must have core competence of that nature. In England, they are called specialist judges. A judge who is good in commercial law cannot do anything other than commercial law because he is good in that. We have got our rotating system and it may not be so good, it may be good. There are pros and cons to that. Okay? Then time management. There can be a whole lecture on time management. I am not going to deal with that. There are people who do time management. But we all need our time management. Simple thing, they say, 80% of the things are done in 20% of the time. And 20% of those important things take up 80% of the time. So it's called the 80-20 rule, the main important rule of time management. Then there is procedural simplification, which is required everywhere, but more so in law. In our things, there are so many things which can be simplified. You know, some orders which can be passed without a written application, some orders which can be passed immediately on a written application by saying to both parties, okay, this can be done. Airs have to be brought on record. Can you say, no, don't bring the airs on record? You simply write, file your reply, then files a rejoinder, then there is an order. It can be finished off that way. Okay? So your clients feel that you have come to the main thing quickly. Then comes a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift is very important. That is taking up the most important main thing first. That is the paradigm shift. And we must have a paradigm shift in our work from the mundane to the important. That is how I would put it. Then comes, now for, for example, I'll give you one example. I've been giving these examples there. But say, for example, the Swiss watch. Hmm? The Swiss make the best watches. Everybody knows Omega, whatever. One Swiss man invented the quartz watch. So all Swiss people said, well, our watches are the best in the world. Our clocks are the best in the world. What is this kind of a new clock? Rejected. He sold this idea to a Japanese. And today we all wear quartz watches. We don't wind our watches. We have no time to wind watches. Okay. This was a paradigm shift. Means you are doing something in one way, you feel, I think, something is grossly wrong. So you do it in a completely different way. Now, all of these things which we are discussing, you can work out with your principal judge or whichever way, even amongst yourselves, and come out with some kind of a paradigm shift, something new, but within the law. Whatever is not bad can be done. That's how I would say. Then the decentralization. Now, I told you, for example, the writ of summons. How do you serve? Formerly, we were serving only through the bailiff. Bailiffs had no time. For months and years, services were not done. Then under the 1999 CPC, you can serve by registered post, email, etc., etc. So, you can decentralize. Everybody does that. When I was the principal judge of the family court, I realized that so many of the petitions are not served for so many months. So, I said, 
the lawyers can take the sum writ of summons and serve upon the defendant, respondent. Okay, eighty percent of the matters were served. I didn't have to tell my bailiffs. Then twenty percent, that is, the ten percent were when they could not serve. So I had to pass orders for registered post AD or whatever that was. And only ten percent of the matters were where the lawyers really harassed me and said, "No, we will not do it that way." I don't know why they did that. You know, you must send the bailiff. And I used to send the bailiff, and over a period of time, I gave all the different works to the bailiffs, and there were no bailiffs at that time. So you know. This thing can be there are certain things which can be decentralized. Even in your practice as lawyers, you can decentralize, don't you? This is a small matter. You tell your junior, go and do it. You will do something with your client, which is a bigger matter because you have now come of age. Okay, something like that. So that's decentralization. These are all business principles which we can apply in our legal practice. Okay. Then the latest first. This is what I learned in England. We always have these cases. Which are the oldest cases? We must take up first. All right. Once we are taking up the oldest cases, the new cases become old. Then we take up those cases when they become old. Then again, other new cases become old. Have you seen that? Now, if you have one court for the latest cases, what happens is that the when a, there is a good suit filed, false defences will come down. Why are false defences taken up? Because it takes so much time for the ultimate judgment, so the lawyer also says, "Say whatever is false." The client also wants to take up a false defence. But if the cases come up quickly, then they will not do that because what is the point? Ultimately, the case comes up. Similarly, frivolous suits can be filed because you get an injunction and then you go on waiting for six years. So the lawyer will say, "File and let us see. We'll take a chance." Okay. So if you take up, I was told totally in England when I was studying. That is latest first becomes very important. The latest cases of some nature, some kind of cases, judges must be able to take up first. Then there can be a separate court, or in each court the judge can say that this is a very clear case. Put it on Friday. I will take it up. You know. So at least the per person who has got a very clear case gets a judgment, and there is some kind of tangible justice. All right. That's it. Then we have. I I'll give you one short story on this. You know when the British were ruling us, they were very scared of the snakes. That is the snake story which I have put there. So, the Brit one British general instituted prizes for killing snakes because they were very scared. So people started killing snakes and taking the prize. And then people realized that this is very lucrative. You have to have. So they actually reared snakes to kill snakes to get the prize. And then that British all thought, okay, well, how is it that there, there are as many snakes as there were before? So he wanted to find out that, and he found out this ingenious way of dishonesty, and he stopped the award. There were as many snakes as there were before. Now this is something like our system. You file a suit. You make it delayed, delayed, delayed. Then you get a judgment. In the meantime, other suits get old. So there is nobody who goes home happy that I have got a judgment in let us say at least two years. He has to wait for some twelve years, fifteen years to get the judgment because everything goes on that way. Okay, that's how it is. Then there are the sharing best practices, which is always followed in companies. So, if you find out that there is somebody who is doing some good work, this is really helping. One judge or one lawyer doing that way, it is always good to share those kind of practices, okay? And everybody else can replicate it. Then there are systemic challenges. Now, this is in every walk of life, in every profession. Some things are in your control. It's a very small circle, the circle of control. Then, bigger thing is the circle of influence. You may not be able to control, but you can influence in a given way. And the other is really that circle of concern. You, what is going to happen? Now, please visualize in our profession what happens. Very little control you will have over the other opponent, but you can have control over your client. Okay? You may not have control of the court, but you can come together and tell the court. No, no. So there is a circle of influence. It is a little bigger. You can, by your own 
experience by your own way of talking whatever way you can influence your client in the right possible way and not sort of you know misguide the client i would say as some lawyers do you know that okay and then there is this other circle where you have to go to the judge the control and then you get what you want so this is the way business people work they know where to give in and where not to give in but unfortunately lawyers don't work like business people and judges don't work like business people at all so we can work that way then there are those uh, uh, single and double loop thinking now that is what single is what your client comes and tells you something you write it down in the notice you write it down in the plane and that is it but double loop thinking is to find out why that happened how that happened so that you will be able to negotiate with the other side if you understand that like you know there is a partnership what really went wrong with the partnership if you find out that then you will be you you kind of you know uh, they can say you caught the thief thief okay then you will be able to negotiate well so there can be single and double loop thinking now this is also very well taught in the business schools with this example and this is a true life example there was this americans and the russians the soviets you know so they were always having the cold war and they would have fighter jets to find out somebody else's things you know the russians would come the americans would go they felt that the russian fighter jets were faster and they were going higher the american fighter jets could not do that but yet they brought down the russian fighter jets in more cases then the russians took the american fighter jets so everybody said you know ha ah, because we are americans and you know our fighter jets are we are we are very clever etc etc but there was one american stephen boyd who said no there must be something else and he observed this over a period of time and he found out that americans are good at maneuvering but the russians are good at going higher and going faster that was the real reason why the americans could maneuver and take the russian jets okay now this can be replicated in our profession also there are some people who do civil work well who know how to do a particular thing how to settle there are some lawyers who are good at settling there are some lawyers who are good at arguments you know so you find out the best points you know and that is how you do so that is single and double loop thinking you think what is going to be best for you and then there is this package deal which is very important for lawyers now you know the tourism industry many years ago several of the senior people would know when we were uh, going abroad when we were going anywhere in india also we, had, we were booking those tickets and the air tickets used to be like this with those copies okay the tour agents would only book the tickets nothing else then the tour agents started booking the hotels also they liked it then the tour agents started booking cars you land at another place and then there'll be a car waiting for you you know that kind of thing. then they started booking the tours also so people started liking it because they don't want to do all that research they are business people they are professionals and all so they go to a tour agent and say make a tour of 8 days for this place at about this much cost and you get the whole tour ready made for you by professional people okay now lawyers are something like that so you have what is called a package deal you tell your clients see i can give you 35 adjournments and i am going to charge you for 35 adjournments but if you want i can give you some kind of a order after three adjournments only what do you prefer and believe me all clients will say i prefer the second thing and you say okay i'll charge you this much i will give you instead of 35 adjournments this much it is a something like a package deal okay so you can work out with your client how you can give the best to your client and of course take your fees so as they say make money but make money by doing good don't only make money by delaying that's what i would say okay then comes continuous education 
In every profession today, there is continuous education. This is something like continuous education. It is a very good lecture series that is arranged for you by these people. So you know about different things from different people. And you can come together and discuss them. So that is continuous education. And of course, the team. Team is together each achieves more. T-E-A-M. And there can be a team between lawyers and judges, between lawyers and lawyers, between lawyers and clients. Okay? So these are the business principles that we can have. And therefore I would say that these are ten two-letter words. If it is to be, it is up to me. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. What a fabulous lecture. Illuminating on various aspects of civil procedure. I think it will be helpful for all our criminal advocates also. Thank you very much. Now I will take this opportunity to thanks first of all Ketan Parikh sir who gave the valuable time also today also performed his task after uh, and followed the yes Parikh sir's wish and donated us 5 lakh rupees to the library of this disabled part. <laughs> Very okay. He is insisting not to mention, but I have to mention it because we are, see, we are, as a family, we have to mention everything to everyone. That is, a, and I am thankful to our madam also. She took all the time in the world today and she came specifically for this purpose. And she was such a punctual, again, I repeat, again, she was here before 5 p.m. And she was, and thank you for, uh, thank you the audience also for uh, coming together for such a nice lecture. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. I just mean, on behalf of our association, we are presenting you the momento. I request you to say. Thank you very much. I feel in view of our 75 years celebration. Thank you, thank you, the audience. Please have tea and coffee. And then only please do. Thanks a lot.